Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining SOCAN. Uh, we see a lot of names on our participant list that we're not familiar with in the acidification community. So we're really excited to be hosting this webinar today, uh, crossing over two very important water quality and environmental issues along our um, coasts. We're going to be talking about the connection between harmful algal blooms and um, ocean acidification, well, really coastal acidification events in our region. Uh, I'm just trying to fix my screen. There we go. So the goal of SOCAN is obviously to connect uh, science and stakeholders, and we're really excited to do that today with uh, two guest speakers. Uh, from the science community, as well as hosting all of our stakeholders in this meeting. So just to go over a few meeting logistics while folks are still being admitted into the meeting, and I just want to say thank you for being patient while we go through the admission process, uh, which we just kind of do it for security purposes and to avoid uh, Zoom bombing, which has been a growing concern these days. So all of our listeners are in listen only mode. So you will be muted. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers or about SOCAN during the presentation, please go ahead and drop those in the chat. We'll we have several monitors that will be watching the chat today. For this particular workshop, we're gonna have two short presentations and then we're gonna have a nice long extended question so and answer. So uh, just give us, uh, you know, time. It'll give us time to have a nice panel discussion. Uh, just for um, the purposes of wanting to share with the community as widely as possible, we are recording this meeting today and it will be posted on the Sakura YouTube channel. Just to give you a little bit of an introduction to SOCAN, we are essentially a virtual network. Our executive team is composed of Deborah Hernandez, who is the executive director of Socora, which is SOCAN's uh, fiscal home and kind of where we have all of our um, connections and meetings. Uh, Laura Corman, who was is introducing the meeting today, or is our Socora liaison. And then Emily Hall and myself, we are the SOCAN uh, project co-coordinators. We're steered by our science and stakeholder working groups. And if anybody is interested in learning more about SOCAN or getting involved with our working groups, you can email us at SOCAN at Sakura.org. We uh, cover the region between um, the west coast of Florida all the way up to Cape Hatteras. Uh, so, our region overlaps a little bit with GCAN, which is the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Acidification Network, and our partners up to the north, MACAN, the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network. Uh, hopefully we have some of our partner CAN members here today because of course, water doesn't know boundaries. And so we like to work very closely uh, with our partners. Uh, we're an ocean acidification program funded program but we also receive funding from several other projects, including uh, IUS and Socora. And now we have a project that is funded through um, the South Carolina Sea Grant. This year, especially SOCAN has been focusing on vulnerability. Uh, and what vulnerability means to us is sensitivity of animals environmental vulnerabilities and how vulnerable uh, acidification affects the human dimension. We're working very closely with the interagency working group on ocean acidification to identify vulnerabilities throughout our region. One of those vulnerabilities that we recently identified at our December stakeholders workshop were harmful algal blooms and how harmful algal blooms and acidification act as co-stressors to the environment. So essentially, SOCAN's mission is to work directly with scientists, resource managers, industry experts, and educators, both formal and informal educators, to facilitate research and discussion to address coastal and ocean acidification impacts in the United States, uh, in the Southeast United States. And to learn more about SOCAN, you can visit our website, which 
also happens to be a focus of our work this coming year as we'll be updating the website at socan.sacora.org. So I'm gonna hand this off right now to Laura, who, or I'm sorry, to Emily, who's gonna be giving us a brief uh, synopsis of harmful algal blooms and, and the acidif acidification connection uh, in the US Southeast. Thanks, Janet. Um, so just a very, very brief background because I don't want to talk about too much that our, our guest speakers are gonna speak about today. So um, there has been a lot of interest in the last few years um, looking at HABs and coastal acidification, trying to understand the connections, the causes and, and overlapping effects. And so just a brief background on HABs throughout the US Southeast. We have uh, a number of different HAB species that can be found in our freshwater springs, lakes, rivers, our lagoonal estuaries, and coastal waters. Um, in our region in the Southeast, there's a unique regional biological chemical and physical drivers, as well as local, regional, and global stressors that all play a role in the prevalence of these blooms. We often hear about nutrients, for example, and harmful algal blooms, but there is, there's a lot more that, that creates complex, uh, uh, a complex situation, especially even within the Southeast, there's different regions throughout the Southeast where there, there's, there's different roles. Three big species that have ha resulted in regulatory actions in the Southeast due to the presence of toxins and effects on local economy and ecology include Karenia brevis, which produces a brevitoxin. I am sure that Tristan will be giving us a lot more information on the background of that. Uh, Pyrodinium bahamense, bahamense and Pseudonychia species blooms, um, saxitoxins and domoic acid. We also have ciguatera toxins that are found more in Southern Florida. Now, there are other harmful algal species throughout the Southeast, but those are three of our biggest ones that have, like I mentioned, um, resulted in regulatory actions. Um, <clears throat> and, but a lot of these other species do predict, um, produce significant human health and environmental impacts at both local and regional levels. Uh, the figures on this slide are from a paper by Anderson et al. in 2021 showing frequency of toxic events. Um, it's through the whole U.S., but I did put boxes around some of those in the U.S. Southeast. Next slide, please. And so there's increasing evidence that suggests that HABs and ocean acidification are intrinsically linked in both drivers, interactions, and biological effects. And human activities are basically altering the environment in ways that promote HABs and OA, increasing magnitude, frequency, and duration, and or extent. And for HABs, these conditions typically include favorable salinities, temperatures, and alkalinities, ample supply of nutrients, calm waters, and stratified conditions, as well as the right kind of light. Um, they are essential to the health impacts on humans, environment, and, and, and overall economy, for example. Um, two of the primary, so, so there have been some studies on OA and HABs, but not a lot. Um, but two of the primary HAP species responses to A so far that have been looked at and tried to be understood are growth rates and toxicity. But there's still major uncertainty in HAB response to OA, as well as um, effects that HABs may play on local carbonate chemistry environments. And so species, there's species and strain specific responses of HAB species of, to OA. There's a lack of experimental studies. Um, we don't understand fully the interactive effects mm -hmm. of OA. See? If you guys could please mute yourselves, that would be great for the rest of the talk. Thank you. Um, and then there's complexity of benthic and planktonic community assemblages and changing competitive fitness of HABs. Um, and then there's the potential for long-term evolution even of HABs to different carbon, chemi uh, carbon chemistry changes. And again, we're only just touching the surface on, on understanding many of these things. Next slide, please. And so some concerns include where are these where are these harmful algal blooms going to go? There are some that stay very local in very localized areas, but with changing climate um, and including acidification, we may see movement of things like Karenia brevis from the Gulf Coast of Florida going all the way up into North Carolina and might be more pre prevalent up there causing issues. In 1987, there was a documented red Karenia brevis red tide that originated off the Florida West Coast and was transported all the way up to North Carolina that caused a closure on heart of oysters and clams for six months. Now, at that time, it was determined it was because of a, a Gulf Stream transport, but there may be other um, regional and, and um, <clears throat> 
uh, larger impacts from acidification and warming. Next slide, please. And so uh, last year, NOAA got together and held a workshop specifically on OA and HABs, and they produced a report, and then the report is uh, by Turner et al. in 2021. It's a, it's a HABs and OA workshop report that is available. Um, and this is just a brief list of some of the gaps in research and understanding of HABs and OA. And so we are, again, just scratching the surface on, on understanding impacts of HABs on OA and OA on HABs. And hopefully some of the the talk information today will provide us with some background information and starting to understand what some of these impacts may be. Next slide. All right, and now I'll pass it over to Laura Corman. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, this will just be a very brief talk. Uh, my name is Laura and next slide, please. So I'm a program coordinator for Socora, um, which is the Southeast Coastal Ocean Observing Regional Association. It's quite the mouthful, but basically I serve on the executive team with Emily and Janet for SOCAN. And I'd be happy to chat about anything in my presentation offline. So I've left my email up there to reach out if need be. Uh, next slide, please. So Socora um, is the administrative and fiscal home for SOCAN which is why I serve on the executive committee. And like I said, it's the Southeast Coastal and Ocean Observing Regional Association. So we're part of many regional associations throughout the United States. Our region is very similar to SOCAN. It's North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, which you can see here. Um, and this map shows actually some of the monitoring that Socorro supports, which includes coastal buoys and high frequency radar. Socorro is often referred to as the weather service for our ocean and coastline. So we put a lot of ocean observing and monitoring technology into the water um, to help provide data and information to our stakeholders. And we are only specific to the Southeast. Next slide. So very briefly before our talk, I just wanted to touch, um, Socorro is starting to delve into the HAB world as well. We currently do support some HAB monitoring within our region. So we partner with FWRI, NOAA's AOML, USF, and Moat Marine Lab. And like I said, right now, Socorro is supporting buoys, um, underwater gliders, ship-based field surveys, and satellite remote sensing, all which support HAB monitoring and observing in the region. We also additionally support some modeling of sargasm, which is basically an upcoming HAB in our region, in the Caribbean specifically. So basically, Socorro put together a harmful algal bloom plan, which is um, lists some of the resources that are already existing in our region and some gaps we need to fill in terms of HAB monitoring in the Southeast. And Socorro will be receiving a small federal allocation to help support um, investment in the future. So be on the lookout for this plan to be posted to Socorro's website and for a small pot of money that will be going out via RFP um, to support HAB monitoring and observing in the region. Next slide. I'm gonna pass it over to Janet today to introduce our guest speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And I'll just say quickly that if you are interested in receiving updates from Socorro or SOCAN, you can sign up on our websites. So it would be sakora.org and socan.sakora.org. There are uh, places to put in your email address so you can get onto our listservs. So probably the main reason that everyone is here today is to hear the, um, some updates on HAB and acidif HAB with acidification research in our region. So we're very lucky today to have two speakers. Our first speaker is Tristan Bursell. She's an early career postdoctoral researcher at the Red Tide Institute at Moat Marine Lab. Uh, Tristan joined Moat Marine Lab recently after she finished her PhD in 2021 at, the at uh, Florida State University. Her research focuses mostly on Karenia brevis and how it responds to changes in atmospheric CO2, which is one of the primary controls on acidification and which factors influence and control HABs that are formed on the west coast of the Florida shelf. Uh, 
Tristan will be our first speaker. And then after that, we will have Dr. Hans Pearl, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction from, uh, from SOCAN, but Hans has spent his career researching uh, estuarine biogeochemistry, nutrient cycling, phytoplankton and HABs, water quality and human and climate impacts on coastal waters. Uh, I remember reading um, Dr. Pearl's papers when I was an undergrad. So I don't really wanna say how long that has been, but we're very excited to have him here today with us. And also just wanna note that data from two of his projects, which are Modmon and Ferrymon, are, can be found on the Socorro Ocean uh, data portal. Uh, so we're very lucky to have them both. And I will now pass it off to Tristan uh, so if anybody has any questions again, please do enter them in the chat. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about Florida red tide in a changing Gulf of Mexico, kind of what we know and what we need to better understand. Next slide. Florida red tide is caused by a coastal, primarily photoautotrophic dinoflagellate called Karenia brevis, pictured here on the right. Karenia brevis blooms are the most commonly occurring hab in the Gulf of Mexico and are actually one of the most predictable habs globally. They occur almost annually in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico where they form these large persistent blooms. And here on the bottom right, I have shown a map from Florida Fish and Wildlife from last July's Florida red tide showing the different K. brevis concentrations in Southwest Florida. These blooms typically initiate between July and October and they last anywhere between two and 26 months. The average being about seven and a half months. And the downside of these blooms is that they have large human health, environmental and economic impact. For example, about 1,400 tons of dead fish were removed from Tampa Bay in July and August of 2021, the bloom shown above. My lab mates were actually involved in some mitigation work with all of those dead fish and can tell you how great and fun that was. So there's obviously a lot of interest in this species. So how is ocean acidification affecting Florida red tide dynamics? Next slide. You can go to the. I want to start with a quick overview of atmospheric CO2 and ocean acidification, which we know are inherently linked. So, when we're talking about ocean acidification, we're referencing the change in ocean chemistry caused by the dissolution of atmospheric carbon dioxide into water. Next slide. The dissolution of CO2 into water leads to increased dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations and a co-occurring reduction in pH, which we know as ocean acidification. This is particularly important moving forward as the oceans absorb about 25% of our anthropogenic CO2 emissions each year. I also want to point out what happens to the system in a bloom situation. This is relevant since a lot of previous work done on Karenia has focused on CO2 effects on physiology, including CO2 limitation, instead of just looking at OA. So in a bloom situation, the opposite happens in regard to carbon chemistry, where we have our DIC drawn down and pH increasing. So now let's look at the previous work that's been done on this important species so far. Hardison et al. looked at Karenia under bloom conditions, looking at that CO2 limitation. The graph I have shown below shows our days on the x-axis and total brevitoxins normalized to cell volumes on the y, with our closed circles being CO2 replete cells and open squares CO2 limited squares or cells. What's important to note here is that they found increased brevitoxin under CO2 limitation suggesting a CO2 effect on brevitoxin production in the cells. Next slide. So next we have Arrera et al. 2014, which looked at Karenia under pre-industrial, modern and future conditions. And in this graph, we now have temperature groupings 
with the white bars being the low CO2, pre-industrial, gray, modern, and black, high CO2. And what's important here is increased growth with increased CO2 concentrations at both temperatures, suggesting also potentially a CO2 effect on growth. Despite differences in the culture methodology and carbonate chemistry manipulation between these studies, they both suggest that Karenia is sensitive to changes in CO2 concentrations and responds by regulating different metabolisms. However, neither of these two studies looked at any of the underlying processes to provide a sort of mechanistic understanding of these responses. The next slide. This leads us to the work that I've done on Karenia. I grew Karenia under low, ambient, and high CO2, representing bloom, modern, and climate change conditions. Unlike the previous two studies, I found no changes in cellular parameters like growth rate or brevitoxin content, as is shown in the graphs to the right for my three treatments. Furthermore, I didn't see any changes in other parameters either, like morphology, chlorophyll A content, or even photosynthetic rates. This was a little confusing. So to explain the apparent lack of a CO2 response, we looked at some of the underlying processes in carbon metabolism. So next, what I did find was that Cape Brevis adapted its inorganic carbon acquisition and utilization strategies based on the ambient CO2 concentrations. In this plot, I have shown the fraction of CO2 used in photosynthesis for the different treatments. The dotted line delineates mainly carbon dioxide versus mainly HCO3 or bicarbonate uptake, which are different forms of inorganic carbon that Karenia can use for photosynthesis. What's important here is we see an increasing preference for carbon dioxide uptake with increasing ambient carbon dioxide. So under low CO2, only about 15% of your carbon for photosynthesis came from CO2, while the remaining 85% came from bicarbonate. While under our high CO2 treatment, about 60% of carbon for photosynthesis was from CO2. Now this is really significant because CO2, it freely diffuses into cells while bicarbonate requires the active energy driven uptake of cells. So by switching their preference for what form of carbon they take up, they would actually be able to free up cellular energy and resources, particularly under future climate change and ocean acidification scenarios. However, we know that ocean acidification is not an isolated phenomenon. So next, I think, um, we want to look at some effects from other co-occurring changes. One I wanna to touch on real quick is temperature, which is something the Gulf of Mexico is already seeing changes in. So next. Surprisingly, not a lot of studies have actually focused on temperature effects on Karenia, and those that have kind of didn't really look at longer term acclimation of cells, something we're finding increasing evidence for the importance of. Here, I have so shown some literature values from lab and field studies, and you see a wide range in lab studies for growth about four to 33 degrees C, with most studies saying you get an upper limit for growth or cell death at around 30 or above. And the optima seems to be about 22 to 28 in both lab and field studies. However, something interesting is seen in the field data from the Florida HAB historical database, which has a range extending from nine to 38 degrees. And like in last summer's bloom, which I thankfully got to be a part of sampling on my, in my current position, and I showed a map of earlier, we actually found Karenia happily blooming in water temperatures exceeding 34 degrees. So something's going on there. And I really want to touch on this data in particular real quick, as it's something my collaborators and I have been working on in the current position on my postdoc with the NOAA EcoHab grant. So next slide. 
Here I have plotted the historical data for all K. brevis blooms between 1947 and 2021 with average water temperatures and different concentration bins of K. brevis. And what is really striking here is the relationship between average water temperature and Karenia concentration. A positive relationship with an R squared of 0.87, which is pretty good for field data. This has significant implications for an area highly impacted by climate change and predicted to be increasingly affected like Southwest Florida. And it really highlights the importance of re-examining the role of temperature in Karenia brevis physiology, especially in conjunction with other stressors like OA. Next slide. So this leads me to some future directions for research on this important species that would help to fill some knowledge gaps. So first, the physiological responses to complex environmental cues are not well resolved for Karenia. And it highlights the importance of doing multi-stressor experiments that combined OA effects with other parameters like temperature, light, and nutrient concentrations. In these experiments, they need to not only look at responses in things like growth and toxin production, but they should also aim to elucidate those underlying mechanisms driving the responses. Getting a more complete suite of information will be very important for model parameterization. In addition, I also think it's important that we investigate the effects of OA on K. brevis, not only in monoclonal culture experiments, but in natural community assemblages. There's a need for an ecophysiological approach taken to investigating HABs and OA dynamics, which looks at changes in trophic interactions and energy flow throughout the food web. For example, many HAB species are mixotrophic to varying extents, including K. brevis. And I really believe it's important for us to fully understand not only the extent intraspecies variation and environmental controls of mixotrophy in Karenia, but also how that is going to impact the natural assemblages it incurs in, who are the winners and losers. Next slide. And that leads me to stepping back and touch on some of the things I think are important for understanding Florida red tide as, the, as a larger ecological phenomena in the Gulf of Mexico. So we know that OA and climate change are affecting a multitude of environmental conditions, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. And to compound that, K. brevis isn't the only HAB which occurs in the Gulf, like Emily mentioned. It actually isn't even the only Karenia species found here. It's one of about 13. So how do we effectively study such a system? It's going to require a combination of single and multi-species experiments, both lab and field-based, which carefully integrate complexity while maintaining clear and testable hypotheses. I know easier said than done, but experiments such as these will be vital for helping to parameterize models and should be done in coordination with modelers to narrow down maybe what is important to focus on, as these will help us understand and make predictions about what the future might look like for HAB dynamics in the Gulf of Mexico as a whole. Lastly, another point specific to the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lack of robust HAB and OA observational data outside of kind of specific locations and time periods. For example, it's not exactly clear if the frequency nor duration of Florida red tides have been increasing in current years due to information gaps or observer biases in our historical database. In addition to not only Karenia brevis data, we need high resolution or maybe continuous sampling of different water quality and OA parameters, along with phytoplankton community dynamics, which would greatly help improve our understanding of the impacts of discrete events like rainfall and hurricanes, 
which are also affected in co-occurring with OA. So as we've been looking at in on the EcoHab project, there's the potential for these events, rainfall, hurricanes, to be important in the timing and duration of cave brevis blooms. So better understanding the impacts of these sort of discrete events would also help us with model parameterizations and future predictions. Next slide. So with that, I would like to say thank you all for listening and give my acknowledgments. I thank NOAA for the EcoHab grant I work on and show a lot of data from my wonderful PIs, Cindy Heil, Sven Kranz, all of my lab technicians, the captain and crew of the boats and Florida Fish and Wildlife for giving me Karenia to work with and plenty of data to work with. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, we're gonna hand over the uh, control here to Dr. Pearl to uh, bring up his uh, presentation. And we're gonna switch and go north up to the, the coast of North Carolina. Hans, you're still muted. You. All right. There you go. <laughs> I think we're making some progress here. All right, let me just go back to the start now. Okay. Uh, can everybody, can you all see this uh, slide? Can everybody see the slide? I don't think you're sharing your screen right now. Uh, uh, and show, let's see. Uh, Can I share? Um, there you okay. go. Okay. You know, after two years of Zooming, I still haven't figured out all the, uh, the finer details, but I think we're getting there. Okay. Are we all there? Look. Are we all there? It looks like it. Okay, good. Okay, well, let me first uh, acknowledge my, uh, my uh, colleagues in, in crime here. Uh, Nathan Hall, who is with me at the Institute of Marine Sciences, and Jeremy Testa and Ming Lee at Horn Point and Chesapeake Bay Biological Laboratories. And this talk is going to deal with the two largest estuaries, uh, Chesapeake Bay system and the Albemarle Pamlico Sound system. And what, we're, what we are doing here is taking advantage of long-term data sets to look at all the drivers and responses that are involved in uh, acidification phenomena in these estuaries. And you can see from this sort of diagrammatic slide that there are a lot of things that impact uh, pH in these systems. Uh, we've already heard about atmospheric CO2, but there are lots of other things, including alkalinity loads, uh, organic matter coming in from storms, et cetera, hypoxia, and, uh, and of course the algal blooms themselves, which are modifying the uh, pH. So I uh, just want to want you to keep that in mind as we go through these uh, uh, hopefully simplified uh, slides showing some of the long-term monitoring data. Let's see here. How do I move? Uh, I'm having trouble here moving going forward. There we go. Okay. Relative importance of ocean acidification versus local drivers of estuarine pH. Well, uh, there. There, in, and this is an inter-system comparison, by the way, that deals with database from 1996 to 2020. Uh, and it's probably the longest term database comparison, I think of any two systems anywhere. Uh, but the thing we wanna deal with and that we are quite aware of in terms of estuarine uh, biogeochemistry is that there's a lot of temporal variability that ex extends on the diel and even longer term uh, 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 trends. Uh, there are also watershed inputs that we need to deal with that also have temporal and spatial variability. And then of course, circulation and biology. So things get very complicated. Spatial 
variability. We know that in estuaries, and you saw that from the first slide, that there's a lot of uh, differentiation in terms of uh, nutrient inputs and primary production in our systems. Uh, and, and this go really goes along the latitudinal extent that we see in both estuaries. Uh, one important thing to uh, recognize right away, and it's certainly true in estuaries, but it's also true in open ocean systems or coastal systems, is that pH varies on a diel basis. And so, and the swings can be over uh, 10% uh, within 24 hours. Uh, that swing in pH is of course due to biological influence on pH, primary production and CO2 uptake, but it's also linked to other things such as tidal influence and uh, the influence of runoff and uh, freshwater input. So, you know, it's really important to obviously measure at the same time uh, if you're gonna look at a long-term trend analysis of uh, pH and uh, factors that influence the pH. And you can see that uh, typically if you sample in the early afternoon, it's gonna be high in a uh, relatively higher. If you sample early first thing in the morning, it's gonna be relatively low. So that's gonna bias your data if you uh, sample at different uh, time intervals. The long-term trends that we see in the New River Pamlico Sound System uh, with pH and chlorophyll A look like this. And these have been analyzed using a seasonal Kendall test and uh, send slope. And what you can see is that there is quite a bit of variation in pH in, these, in the New Pamlico continuum uh, where upstream, uh, there tends to be a, a decrease uh, or a change to the decrease. Whereas in the estuary itself, you can see that there are actually swings that show increases in pH. And if we look at chlorophyll A, there's a pretty good relationship there between uh, chlorophyll A or standing stock of the phytoplankton and what's going on with the pH swings in this system. You can see it here uh, upstream in the uh, sort of where things slow down in the estuary uh, and then uh, downstream as well in Pamlico Sound. So that's another factor uh, in terms of the spatial uh, variability. If we look at the uh, drivers of pH using a generalized additive model, which incorporates all the sort of drivers of the uh, pH that we're seeing, you can see that there's a lot of variability here. The nice thing about GAM is that it takes away the sort of linear uh, look, at, look at these relationships versus a, a more uh, realistic uh, uh, swing here in trends. And you can see that there were trends downward and then upward uh, later on in the year in uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we have, we've done the same thing in the News Pamlico. I just wanted to sort of show you the, the data from both systems that we're working on. So that's another important analysis in terms of looking at uh, what's driving uh, pH in, this, in these systems and how it varies over time and in space. If we look at the uh, linkage of chlorophyll A and pH uh, using a Spearman uh, re a regression analysis between the two uh, parameters, it uh, turns out that actually both Chesapeake Bay and the Noose River Pamlico Sound show some really interesting trends. And what you can see is that uh, we have spring blooms in the systems, in both systems, okay, over time, which drive up the pH and they also drive up the chlorophyll A, or I should say the chlorophyll A gets driven up and then the pH comes up as well. And then uh, we see up upstream uh, trends as well with uh, freshwater blooms that are impacting the system. They're also driving up the pH. Uh, and then we have fall, blooms in both systems. Uh, they're mainly dominated by dinoflagellates. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you see this uh, sort of bluish area. This is where the pH would be lowest and also the chlorophyll A would be lowest. And you can see it in both systems, okay? Chesapeake Bay, not, well, you can see it in both systems, but really profound in the Noose River Pamlico Sound. And that's because we get whacked by hurricanes uh, during this fall season. They have a tendency to drive down pH uh, in large part because of the huge influx of fresh water that has organic matter with it and also alkalinity changes that are changing the pH. So again, the spatial relationships are really important here in terms of driving 
uh, what we see in terms of uh, both production of phytoplankton species, including HABs, and the uh, pH that we see in the system. And there's the uh, fall sort of depression that we see in pH. Uh, and it's more profound in North Carolina than in Chesapeake Bay because we usually take the hit for Chesapeake Bay anyway when these hurricanes uh, make landfall. Okay, so here's some data from Hurricane Matthew uh, on the uh, Noose River Pamlico Sound in terms of salinity, pH, and chlorophyll uh, uh, over, time, uh, over uh, distance. And what you can see is you can see that depression that's going on here in pH after the storm event. Uh, and then uh, that's preceded by a bloom. And then the bloom again uh, comes back later on and you can see that that drives the pH back up as well. So uh, events are really important as well. So we've covered time, space, and events. And the, the storms that we see, they are bringing in a lot of organic matter. And that organic matter tends to uh, decrease uh, pH, but also impacts alkalinity coming from the watershed. And you can see that that has a really big effect on uh, ratios of, the, of carbon to nitrogen and uh, DIN to TOC. So again, uh, uh, external forcing factors such as storms, which bring in more organic matter, have a huge impact on what we see in terms of the relationship between uh, pH and uh, phytoplankton production. So just to summarize, uh, and let me just uh, stress, by the way, when we're talking about phytoplankton in these systems, we're not only talking about dinoflagellates, we're also talking about cyanobacteria. And it turns out that in both systems, cyanobacteria have been on the upswing, and they play a really important part of uh, not only the HAB scene, but also driving uh, um, CO2 and pH. So phytoplankton productivity drives pH uh, up in both estuaries and contributes to long-term trends. The diol pH cycle should be accounted for uh, because uh, I think they are really important in terms of uh, putting together a credible uh, trend analysis. The influence of productivity on an interannual pH variability varies by season and location in a similar way between systems, which is really nice because we've been able to analyze these systems as they get hit by single storms, for example, and we can see very similar relationships, as well as the spring bloom phenomena that we see in both systems. Changes in the watershed loading of alkalinity is an important driver of pH. Uh, and we've shown that in Chesapeake Bay in particular, but also it's occurring in the new Pamlico system. So that's a pH modulator. Oops, how do I go back here? pH modulator as well. And then storm impacts demonstrate multiple mechanisms, organic rich freshwater inputs, uh, bloom stimulation, uh, both of which affect pH in these systems. The bottom line is it's complicated but explainable. And if we look at these individual drivers of uh, pH in the system, we can see that it is complex. It's not just phytoplankton affecting pH or pH affecting phytoplankton, but we have to deal with what's going on in terms of watershed processes that are impacting uh, pH and ultimately have dynamics in both of these systems as well. And I think I'll stop there. Uh, I did want to put in a plug for cyanobacteria as well because uh, they are an important uh, uh, factor in terms of the HAB dynamics that we're seeing in our estuarine systems and they are expanding. They're expanding in Texas Bay, Almar Pamlico Sound, uh, California Bay Delta, uh, Gulf of Northern Gulf of Mexico. So Let's keep them in the game as well as we consider uh, the interactive effects of uh, HABs and pH. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, we would like to open up now for a discussion. Uh, if anybody has questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat and we will read them as they come up. Our first, and I also just wanna say that even though uh, you may specifically want to direct a question to one of our panelists, the idea is to kind of get everybody's take on this. So we might, there might be a little bit of discussion back and forth. And so just 
be aware of that. <laughs> I'm going to so, stop my I'm going to stop my share right so that you can run the show from here on out. Well, this is the last slide, so you can okay. leave it there if you want. Okay. So, uh, our first question, uh, Dr. Pearl, how did you deal with your long-term data in trend analyses to account for time of day? For example, pick one time or use a daily average. Uh, well, we did both. We, we uh, have looked at it in terms of uh, sampling at different times in these systems and we could see the bias from that. And then uh, also we analyzed that in relation to the overall average in the system. I hope that answers the question. Uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, we keep very good track of time and space in both estuaries. So it was a, so we were able to do this analysis in a pretty thorough way. As a follow up, I have a question about that. Have you um, analyzed different, um, or have you done that analysis also with uh, like water height? Is there any correlation yet to sea level change? I don't think we've looked at that in this particular analysis. Now my co-authors could potentially chime in here if that's the case, but I don't think we have. And of course, water height is also controlled in both of these systems by uh, freshwater input um, and tides. So uh, I think the tides have been incorporated in the GAM analysis for sure. Excellent. That will be very interesting to see because uh, sea level rise sure. is certainly a, a co-stressor for acidification as well. Yeah, and you can see that in Chesapeake Bay, for example, uh, you know, right at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, you can see that effect uh, pretty well where, the, uh, where you know, uh, the acidification factor uh, coming in from ocean water is, is higher. In the Almar Pamlico Sound System, you know, we're locked in by the Outer Banks. So you don't see that intrusion uh, and it's very microtidal. Uh, and that is one difference between the two systems. That's very interesting, thank you. Uh, the next question is, have either of you worked with city or county managers to discuss the idea of OA or PH as something to be included in coastal management plans? Uh, I, you want to go first or you want me to chime in on this? I mean, I'm relatively new. I mean, I just, I have not had the chance yet to. So for me, I have not gotten into that world of it. So you probably have the better answer for that. <laughs> well, the, the main answer I have is that, uh, you know, the main concern is shellfish and calcifying organisms. And so we have been in, um, we certainly have exchanged data with the state's uh, fisheries, um, you know, the uh, North Carolina the Division of Marine Fisheries, and I think it's similar in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they are keenly interested in this data in terms of what's happening with trends with shellfish, uh, um, you know, uh, harvesting and yields. Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, incorporated our data into what they, uh, want to look at in terms of long-term trends. The problems, of course, also are that there is a top-down pressure on these organisms. So uh, it, again, it gets complicated. Uh, uh, oyster and shellfish harvest in North Carolina are impacted by at least uh, uh, pH and acidification factors, but also by uh, harvesting and habitat alteration. Our next question is for Dr. Bursell. Could you talk more about the implications on carbonate chemistry due to Karenia brevis blooms? So I'm not entirely sure what to cover, I guess, but when they're blooming, they alter the carbonate chemistry, not only in changing the pH, but you get changes in your carbon speciation. So when they're blooming, you get a lot less of your inorganic carbon in the form of CO2, and you get more in the form of carbonate. So 
you can, it switches sort of the forms and makes the forms that are more abundant, such as carbonate, those aren't accessible for phytoplankton with photosynthesis. So their blooms impact kind of the speciation of carbon and it can make it a little more difficult for them to take up inorganic carbon. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I think that the alkalinity issue is really important too. Yeah. Uh, coming in from the watersheds. As a follow-up to that, uh, I have a question. Have there been any studies on any species of HABs when, uh, by adjusting alkalinity rather than adjusting uh, dissolved inorganic carbon species? We haven't done that, but you may have done that down in Florida, right? I have not personally. I know we tried to keep that, I believe, okay. relatively constant in ours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the problems is experimental. How do you deal with this stuff experimentally? Because these changes often occur over, the, over a time period of weeks to months and even years. And that's very difficult to uh, mimic using experimental uh, approaches. And it's been one of the main, uh, what should I say, barrier to understanding the effects of uh, acidification in the first place. Uh, on organisms ranging all the way from, you know, microbes to, uh, to shellfish. So uh, again, long-term trend analysis is probably a good way to approach that uh, question. And I think that our colleagues from Chesapeake Bay have, have done a lot of uh, work on that, the speciation question and how that ultimately might impact uh, phytoplankton community composition and uh, yeah, and ultimately potentially blooms. One of the main connectors there, I think, is that under climate change conditions, the Southeast is expected to get warmer and wetter. And with more fresh water going into our watersheds, the question will arise, how does the increase in the fresh water, which would be a decrease in alkalinity, uh, affect overall effect uh, blooms in, uh, in coastal waterways, but also how would it directly impact pH? So one of the things that Socora, uh, sorry, SOCAN, well, and Socora, I suppose, hope to be able to do is, is have these long-term data sets and make them available to the scientific community and to managers so that we can start to use some of this information to create management plans. So small plug there for future research. Yeah. Um, I might add, uh, in terms of storms, we, we, <laughs> which we have some experience in, um, the alkalinity can go up or down. It all depends on where the water is, uh, you know, where the flood water is being generated and what the sources of alkalinity are in the watershed. Uh, again, my Chesapeake Bay colleagues have done more work than we have on that. Um, um, by the way, we are, plan we are in the process of putting a publication together on this. And I think that there'll be quite a bit more discussion on that topic. We look forward to it. Our next question is, seagrass is critical to a healthy aquatic environment. Is there evidence from any studies implicating OA and possibly HAB toxin in the degraded health of Florida's stressed seagrass beds? So me personally, I have not looked into studies on the direct health of the seagrass beds themselves. Maybe someone else has more experience of that. My knowledge mostly has been from the transfer of the brevitoxins into seagrass that then affects manatees. We've found seagrass ends up being an important link in those trophic dynamics for brevitoxins to move up the food web in certain animals like manatees. So I don't know if maybe Hans know more about anything else or if anyone else, you know, that's what I know about that. Yeah, in North Carolina, uh, we've actually looked at the seagrass question quite, uh, it's actually one of the main regulatory uh, things that we're trying to develop in North Carolina. What is the acceptable uh, transparency or optical properties of the water uh, because it turns out that that's probably the main stressor on seagrasses 
in uh, at least within the uh, bounds of the Outer Banks. Uh, the loss of transparency due to uh, increased sedimentation uh, with storm events uh, and also eutrophication, of course, which would be another source of uh, light absorption in the system. And that those are the key, well, that and also color dissolved organic matter, which again can be related to storm inputs. Those are the main drivers right now that we have identified that are impacting seagrass habitability and trends in that. And uh, I might put in a plug, uh, if folks are interested in that, you should definitely get a hold of Judd Kenworthy uh, here at, uh, uh, I, can, I can provide folks uh, Judd's email address, who has really looked at this question thoroughly in, in our systems. Hi, Janet. I, I can uh, uh, talk about the seagrass a little bit as well. There have been a few studies of impacts, at least of OA, on seagrass. And there are theories that, uh, you know, seagrass, like many plants, takes up CO2 and can help alleviate the stress of OA, at least on other aspects of the ecosystems, local ecosystems. Um, but there are some more, I know, um, Marguerite Koch, Cook did some studies looking at effects of OA directly on different species of seagrass. And there are thresholds like any species of, of how much they can take up. And like Tristan was mentioning the different species of carbon, whether it's CO2 or carbonate, bicarbonate, um, what, what they may use. So there is some, some background information, but still just scratching the surface, I would say. Thanks, Emily. Next question is, any thoughts on how extreme high pH events might affect competition over nitrogen in bloom species? I ask because NH4 species shift towards NH3 at a pH greater than nine, which could occur during blooms when TA is low. Yeah, I, I well, I agree with that conceptually. Um, turns out that ammonium in most of our downstream waters is very low. So, uh, you know, the dominant form of inorganic nitrogen is usually nitrate, but you can get ammonium, you know, recycled uh, in the system. Um, it's really a bigger, bigger problem in freshwater uh, systems, which tend to really have big swings in pH. And if there is a lot of ammonium there, you could lose some of the ammonium as ammonia uh, gassing out of the uh, systems, but I don't think it's a big factor in estuarine and for sure not uh, coastal uh, and offshore systems, simply because ammonium uh, levels tend to be extremely low and they uh, usually are involved in, you know, regeneration and then uptake. So uh, I don't think it's a big factor, not with ammonium anyway. And then, uh... Next question is, I think both speakers noted an increasing occurrence of cyanobacteria in coastal events in recent years. What types of cyanos have been on the rise in estuaries, possibly due to increasing in freshwater inputs or changing, or changing salinity? Uh, I would say both. Um, the fresh, you know, a lot of the freshwater cyanos, for example, uh, including some of the real notorious hab species or taxa like microcystis and uh, uh, the lycospermum, which used to be anabina for us older folks. Um, they are carried out further uh, into coastal, uh, estuarine and coastal systems simply because of the larger pulse events that we're seeing with storms. And of course, those also have a higher nutrient load associated with them. So, you know, the cyanos are. Uh, taking advantage of both of those factors that are occurring in uh, in our coastal and estuarine systems, and uh, and then uh, you know th these extreme precipitation events are really big drivers. In Florida, for example, uh, the blooms that have come out of uh, Lake Okeechobee and then into the in Indian River Lagoon, they're really promoted by uh, uh, excess nutrient and freshwater loading because. Okeechobee has to be regulated and uh, so all that fresh water with high nutrients in it is forced down into the estuarine systems on both the Atlantic and uh, Gulf side and in Louisiana, uh, Sybil uh, Bargu has shown that uh, 
A very similar scenario can occur with the uh, Mississippi drainage and the Atchafalaya, uh, where systems in the uh, bayous and uh, that traditionally have been more salty have gotten fresh and increased in nutrient loading. So it, it's a combination of both. And of course, cyanos like it hot. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that uh, dinoflagellates also like it hot. So that's another factor if the temperature increases are occurring you know, in these places. Uh, you have kind of three drivers of the cyanos uh, on the move in our estuarine and, and some coastal systems. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, no, no more questions. But I do have a thought. Um, if either one of you in a perfect world had unlimited funding, what kind of experiment or field station would you set up to ideally be able to look at long-term trends or um, even just short-term variability in uh, both halves and coastal acidification? You want to go first, Tristan? I'll let you go first. Let me think about that for a second. OK, well. Uh, I think the obvious thing is monitoring. We need to have more funds going into uh, long-term monitoring because these effects are really long. They're very small changes over a long time period. Uh, and you know, in the open ocean, it's pretty simple because there, we don't have these complicating factors uh, that I've mentioned to you about estuaries. Uh, um, but in estuarine systems, I think having good monitoring capabilities uh, and uh, having those, uh, in, in, you know, using the same techniques, same calibrations, and all that kind of stuff, uh, we need to put a whole lot more funds into those kinds of activities. And I, it's hard getting that money from, uh, say, NSF, for example, because you know they like to fund basic research. But I think that really uh, to look at the long-term. Uh, changes that we are seeing with acidification, uh, nutrients, and temperature, for example, uh, really can only be teased apart with uh, long-term monitoring programs. And also climatic changes, such as uh, extreme events and, and flooding and that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that we can do a lot of experimental work, but the problem with experimental work is that you know, the changes are kind of forced to be pretty short term changes that we don't really see in the environment itself. Um, but I think the experimental work is good because it does show ultimately which taxa, which species, uh, which part of the biota are ultimately sensitive to acidification events. I'd like to add to that, I guess. So in addition to monitoring, I I think it's really important, like I said, if we had funding, limited funding, really the role to, for particularly Florida, of mixotrophy in Perennia brevis blooms would be something I'm really interested in and in looking at, like I said, the overall trophic dynamics of these. This is a species where some results suggest it could be ingesting other phytoplankton, some might. Some show a lack of evidence for that. So I really think that if we had unlimited funding, it'd be good to do those sort of experiments. And like mentioned by Hans and me in the presentation, a lot of experiments that have manipulated temperature or variables, it's very short term acclimation. For example, when I did my CO2 work, I grew them at the, their respective CO2 concentrations for over seven generations. It was months before I got them stable at that CO2 level where I was getting consistently nice growth. So that way I could be sure even the differences I was measuring were from strictly CO2 and not stress from an acclimation period. I think it's you need funding because culture experiments are a lot of manpower and a lot of work. So I think it's really important to do some more of those experiments. Like I'm currently thinking 
about those in the future where we're not just say trying to jump from 25 degrees C to 33, but maybe some sort of gradual ramp up, looking at differences in how, like a frog, as my advisor likes to put it, the frog in a boiling pot of water, right? They don't put it right in when it's boiling. They see a lot of effects, but as it slowly heats up, they change their physiology. And perennia is very adaptable. So I think it's important to do studies looking on that longer term actual acclimation scale to when we do culture experiments. Yeah, I totally agree with Tristan. And I just wanted to point out that in a way the experiments are happening already. You know, I mentioned these three locations, Florida, um, estuary is getting impacted by freshwater events, Gulf of Mexico, our neck of the woods in North Carolina. Those are experiments that are actually happening. And I think, again, getting back to the really uh, being able to capture those in time and space with good monitoring uh, will really be a, a, a critical component as well. Great, thank you so much. The main reason that I asked that question is because this coming year, uh, all of the CANs as well as the uh, interagency working group on acidification is looking for, will be looking for input on priority monitorization. And that's really important, especially in our region where we haven't quite identified hot spots of acidification yet, and if those hot spots tend to coexist with HABs. So we hope that we'll be able to call on uh, all of our members, as well as all of those interested in co, uh, the co-occurrence of HABs and OA, to really try to dig down to those places that where we need to focus monitoring and what type of monitoring is needed for these types of studies. So that kind of um, wraps up, I think, our, um, our town hall for today. Uh, we don't have any more questions, but lots of accolades and kudos to our speakers. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, SOCAN is, you know, motivated by our, all of our members. So please join SOCAN if you haven't already uh, to stay up to date on the latest in acidification and co-occurrence of HABs. And we thank all of you who are not in the acidification community for joining us today because we're really looking to broaden our reach uh, into different parts of the, the um, acidification world as well into HABs. So again, thank you. Um, and if you're interested in the recording of this presentation, it will be available on YouTube in the next couple of days. So check out the Sequoia YouTube channel and our websites. Thanks again to our speakers and to our funders. Uh, we're happy that you were all able to join us today. Thanks for having us. And thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye.